I grew up in a very athletic family, tennis, horseback riding. My earliest memories of um, hearing about the God of the Bible, though, was around the campfire on the beach of the Delaware shore with my sisters, my mom and dad, hearing stories of Noah, David, Moses, Daniel. But God really, really, he, he really wasn't very personal. All that changed, though, when I was a 14-year-old kid, went away on a kind of a church weekend retreat. And I was challenged by the speaker. He said, kids, I want you to measure your lives up against the Ten Commandments. Well, I had never committed adultery, or I don't think I, I stole anything in a big way, but you know what? It, it didn't matter. As I measured my life up against those commandments one by one by one, oh, I, I got this overwhelming sense that I'm missing the mark. I'm not going to make it. Oh, God, help me. It troubled me at first that God gave us a bunch of commandments that He knew very well we couldn't keep. But then it hit me at that weekend retreat. It hit me. That's why Jesus came. He was the one who kept the commandments. He was the one who obeyed the law, even though I didn't and even though I couldn't. I was only 14, but um, I was able to reach out right then and embrace Jesus and say, I, I need you. I, 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 I want to make it out of earth alive, and you're my only passport, so please. Well, I came home from that weekend retreat, all fired up, all pumped, all excited. But then um, through high school, um, the enthusiasm of what I had done began to wane, especially when I started confusing the abundant Christian life with the great American dream. My prayers were so self-centered, like, uh, God, help me to lose weight. God, I need a new boyfriend. God, give me good grades on this test. Unfortunately, I guess I thought I had done God a great big favor by accepting Jesus as my Savior. And I remember right around my senior year of high school, I prayed, Lord, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this Christian thing right, and I know it. I don't want to go off to college and defame your good name, smear your reputation. I know it's about far more than just me, so do something in my life to jerk it right side up, because I'm really living this life wrong. Just a few weeks after high school graduation, as I was preparing to head off to college, my sister Kathy invited me to go to the beach for a swim. I swam out to this raft, athlete that I was, I didn't even touch bottom, hoisted myself up onto it and then took this really stupid dive into what ended up being extremely shallow water. I snapped my head back when I hit bottom and it crunched my fourth cervical vertebrae, severing my spinal cord. There I was lying face down in the water, desperately hoping that my sister Kathy would please notice that I had not surfaced from my dive. Unbeknownst to me, her back was turned to me. She didn't even see me take that dive. But a crab bit her toe. And it so startled her that she quick turned around in the water to scream to me, Johnny, watch out for crabs. And when she did, she saw my blonde hair floating on the surface. I was face down, ready to drown. She came swimming quickly, pulled me up out of the water, and I never, I never was so grateful for fresh air. She saved me, but for what purpose, for what reason? Because now, lying there in a hospital, doctors told me I was going to have to sit down for the rest of my life as a quadriplegic without use of my legs or, or even my hands. My hands don't work. And I remember thinking, God, is this, is this your idea of an answer to a prayer to be drawn closer to you? If it is, you're never going to be trusted with another one of my prayers again. I mean, I'm a new Christian. How could you have taken me so seriously? I sank into deep depression. I, I remember there were wonderful Christian friends who came to the hospital and they encouraged me. And one Bible verse they shared was from Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to help you, plans to prosper you and to give you a hopeful future. God, you, you mean you plan not to harm me? Well, what do you call quadriplegia, huh? What's that all about? As I read that verse and the context around it, I realized something, that when God said that, he was saying it to his children who were being dragged away into captivity by, 
by the Babylonians. They were going to exile. They were going into slavery. They had decades in front of them of hard, awful suffering. And I began to see that God's plans for a hopeful future for me was not necessarily jumping up, dancing, kicking, doing aerobics, running, walking, getting back use of my arms and my legs. No, God's plans for me go far deeper, a deeper healing, a precious healing of the soul. Because as I was pushed into the arms of God every morning, and that's the truth, even to this day, don't be thinking I'm an expert at quadriplegia, but as it was then in the hospital and as it is today, every morning I wake up saying, Jesus, I can't do this thing called life. Please help me. Please show up. Give me your smile. Give me your strength because I can't make it through the day. And because I go to God with that earnest dependency and, and requirement of His grace every single day, I take that back. No, every single moment I experience the sweetest, most precious, most intimate union with Jesus Christ. So in Jeremiah 29, when God says He won't harm us, it doesn't mean the body, it doesn't mean our circumstances. He's not going to do anything to harm our soul. Yes, our body may get harmed, but it will somehow serve to enrich our soul. In closing, let me just say that quadriplegia, 46 years of it, that's a long time. I deal with chronic pain. I, um, I had breast cancer a couple of years ago, and I remember, I remember as my husband was driving me home in the van from chemotherapy one day, we were talking about how suffering is like little splashovers of hell, kind of like waking us up out of our spiritual slumber. And then we were pulled in the driveway and he said, well, then what do you think splashovers of heaven are? Are they those easy, breezy, bright times where everything's going your way, where you have health? And we said, no. Splashovers of heaven are finding Jesus in your splashover of hell. And to find Jesus in your hell is ecstasy beyond compare. And I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking in this world.